He's a PhD candidate in architecture history and theory at Columbia University. He's taught in architecture since 1991 uh, throughout the Americas. Before moving to New York for his doctoral work, he was the director of the Clemson University Architecture Center in Barcelona, Spain. And um, his, um, the title of his talk is Diego versus Philip, MoMA's 1933 Architecture Room Controversy. First of all, thank you for Clara for inviting me to present uh, this uh, research and for all of you to you know, brave uh, the nine o'clock um, presentation. Um, In 1932, the Museum of Modern Art here in New York presented Exhibition 15, Modern Architecture International Exhibition. This is a very well-known exhibition to us in, in architecture. It um, set and fixed the image of what modern architecture should look like or should be for the interwar period, if not also for later. Um, this exhibition also propelled by uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson's uh, well-known international style architecture since 1922 book um, constructed uh, a universal image of modernity uh, under the guise of, style, of a stylistic unity um, that constructed consistency for modern architecture in three, uh, through, through three points. First was uh, volumes, the construction of volumes as opposed to mass. Second was the principle of regularity as opposed to symmetry. And third, and perhaps most known and most important, and I quote, the dependence on, on the intrinsic elegance of materials, technical perfection, and fine proportions, as opposed to applied ornament. This stylistic consistency created um, two very, defined two very important characteristics for modern architecture. First, it established the negation of any other form of modernity, meaning Art Deco, streamlining, etc., which was then termed as modernistic and not modern. And second, it also established a clear distance from the radical functionalism, quote, the utility and nothing more theory of design that characterized the early developments of the international style. Um, this narrative was constructed through international an international assembly of architectural objects which were composed of European, mainly European uh, examples that set the correct standards uh, of, of modern architectural values and it included examples from the United States and Japan. Latin America was not present in this exhibition. What I bring to you is that before the 1932 architectural exhibition, MoMA presented another vision of the modern with exhibition 14, Diego Rivera, a solo show that grounded the modern on Mexican muralism. This, modern, this modernity was grounded on a narrative art that celebrates social confrontation and revolutionary ideals, all under the banner of a national expression. Rivera's modernity was built with realist figurations demolish the podium, uh, through a performative technique, fresco painting, a production that exemplified the public nature of art and revealed, at the time of the exhibition, the limits of technical reproducibility. Rivera, such was the importance of the performative nature of Rivera's work, of muralism, that, as stated here, Rivera, and I quote the museum, was brought to New York to perform some frescoes for us. After Exhibition 15, Modern Architecture, the Museum of Modern Art then re-elaborated Rivera's um, understanding of, of the proposition of a modernity through muralism by presenting murals by American painters and photographers. This is a list of 
of uh, painters selected by Rivera himself, um, but actually then included the elaboration of murals through photographic reproductions. It could be argued that this, that this is simply a matter of institutional topology, a matter of the Department of Architecture and Painting versus the Department of uh, Architecture, presenting different views of what the modern is. I do recognize this, except that Exhibition 14 and Exhibition 16 that bracket modern architecture cross disciplinary boundaries and make clear claims into the architectural realm. And through this, this they reshape the geography of the international style, reinscribing the universality of the, universe, of the international style with a transnational character. The tension between the tension between the universal condition of the international style and the transnational modernity, this, I would argue, centering difference at the core of the modern, was brought to light in a very small exhibition, Color Reproductions of Mexican uh, Frescoes by Diego Rivera, a exhibition that is now completely forgotten because of the RCA mural uh, fiasco, if you will, where an exhibition where Philip Johnson curator, one of the curators of the Modern Architecture Show, and Diego Rivera are brought together to inhabit what it was, MoMA's first architecture room. Ooh, let's see, go back. Um, my argument is that this is perhaps one of the earliest um, presentations of a transnational construction of interior modernity, and that the presence of Rivera, Rivera produces a contested space within the modern interior. This small, go back, <laughs> this small room affects the recontextualization of muralism from exterior to interior, from public to private. It sees the makeover of the architectonic wall into a panel and from the panel into reproductions. It subjects, it subdues the narrative of social conflict and silences the cries for political action of muralism. In all, it makes muralism inhabit the progressive bourgeois modern interior. But if it, if it does this, this exhibition, it also decenters the main narratives of modern architecture by forcing a dangerous coalition that promotes misunderstanding and alternative readings. Domination, as performed by Johnson, is in constant stage of action where the institutional consciousness of MoMA cannot lean on a naturalized ideology. Challenge from every corner and from every quarter, even from the museum itself, Johnson slash MoMA has to work for at every moment in every image, the seamless universality that he constructed through the international style comes undone. The idea of transnationalism is used usually to disarm or go beyond the idea of the nation. I would like to propose that here, the idea of transnational as a contested modernity that actually disarms the idea of the international. Now, very quickly, because we tend to forget these images, to bring Diego Rivera to, Mex to New York in the 1930s is a quite dangerous proposition. One wonders why the Museum of Modern Art, headed by uh, a particular elite here in New York, uh, would actually venture to pose that. Um, the social, uh, social conflicts were in order of the day. Unions, unions and syndicates were mobilizing in New York. There have been riots since the 1930s, early 31 to 35 in New York. Artists, architects are, uni are um, mobilizing. The unions and syndicates are mobilizing. Racial tensions are quite high. This is not only in, the, in New York, but also across the United States, where militant Negroes, and I quote uh, the New York Times, allied with the Communist Party, um, become associated in extremist uh, politics. All this, is, of course, is crisscrossed with issues of, uh, of uh, racism. This is a letter by Eleanor Roosevelt of 1936 against lynching. 
the radicalness of the, basically the, uh, the political sphere and this moment, as we all know, has been quite radicalized, not only in the United States, but also we tend to forget this in New York, uh, uh, also here in New York, as we can example of uh, the parades of the German-American Bund in 1936 in New York, or this um, yeah, yeah, very unknown uh, moment of what's called the Harlem Hitler, uh, also which was instigator of the 1934 riots in New York, in Harlem. That kind of paints the picture. Mexico also conjures a particular imagery. The fear of the spread of revolution through Mexico as a platform of the Soviet revolt is imminent and quite clear. In fact, one of the organizers, uh, organizers of the Rivera show, Francis Flynn Payne, uh, describes Rivera, and I quote, as the most powerful red in Latin America. So to bring Diego Rivera to New York, Rivera needs a makeover. One of the key images of transformations, I would argue, is that of the revolutionary figure portrayed here in the cartoon of 1916, where Uncle Sam is actually performing um, the cleansing uh, operation that has performed already in the, in, in the Caribbean and in the Philippines, Philippines because of the revolutionary upheaval of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. Um, that image of pacification, which is actually brought here in, in 1916, is an image that's actually continued, I would argue, through the makeover that Rivera uh, suffers. First, through his art in 1926, but, um, through general descriptions by Ernestine Evans, who's actually the person in charge of actually promoting this sort of transformation of, Rivera, of Rivera's work. And which finalizes, I would argue, in, in her book, the very famous frescoes of Diego Rivera, where um, we have the Edward Watson's portrait of Diego Rivera as a calm, introspective revolutionary. The transformation is finalized by MoMA's official portrait of the 1931 show. Here we have the loss of the revolutionary hat, but also compared to other figures, other forms of representation where Rivera is always portrayed as working on scaffolding, he's here portrayed in, as a solitary figure, quietly sitting, holding a brush in delicate posing fashion, indicating a retreat from the realm of traditional painting of, art and of the artist as a solitary genius. The fact that Rivera is alone when fresco painting was a collective endeavor, as he shows in his own self-representations here in the ministry uh, murals in Mexico City, intensifies this retreat from the collective to the individual, from the public to the private. By confining Rivera to the studio, he is confined to the interior world of art, which has the museum as its showcase place. The loss of the architectural dimension, one has to remember that the uh, frescoes performed by Rivera were actually citations of the uh, frescoes in Mexico in actual architectural settings. This loss of the architectural dimension reveals yet another of the great operations of the 1931 show uh, executed, basically the cancellation of the architectural site of muralism. Mexican muralism created a problem for the Museum of Modern Art because it was housed in non-modern, at least stylistically, buildings. This was one of its great detra detractions. Mexican muralism may call for a new society, but it does through in traditionally looking buildings. Here's the Ministry of uh, Education, where Jose Vasconcelos had a very heavy hand on the extension of an original colonial building into this uh, new wing, um, um, which is part of the museum, where the Rivera frescos are located. The solution wasn't to hide and underplay the architectural sites and to celebrate independence of the murals through movable panels. This separation from the architectural wall opens a new, ex uh, new experimental possibilities. The celebrations of the actual mobility of mural paintings uh, is highly sort of praised by MoMA itself, but it also intensifies their decorative aspect. It also disarticulates the relationship between space and pictorial narrative. If we can turn for a second 
to Joseph Urban's 1930 New School for Social Research, one can even visit, even today, I do this because it's also here in New York, uh, its murals here, the Benton mural from the 1930, but also here, very important, in a horrid picture, the Orozco paintings, were paint which uh, inhabited originally what was the communal uh, dining room. So there's a weave of the, of the imagery and the architectonics of the space that um, is that it's fundamental to the relationship between muralism and architecture. The conversion to panels that MoMA promulgated represents a new twist, perhaps, in the revolutionary slogans in Mexico that cry precisely, erase the walls, when the Rivera was actually painting in Mexico. Urban's new school also helped us to focus a little bit on the argument that Philip Johnson is trying to deploy through modern architecture. He praises the use of color in uh, Urban's interiors, yet however, he's completely silent of any of the mural, um, any of the murals by, either, by um, either, certainly by Orozco or by Benton in, in the building. Johnson attempts to define the stylistic vision of modern architecture in 19, uh, in, uh, in, through, a com through strict comparison with the Bauhaus and the influences in Europe, where pure abstraction is used to actually deploy the values of modernity. Now, Johnson attempts to define its stylistic vision of modern architecture in 1931, the year before mo the Modern Architecture Show, through what is known as the Rejected Architect Show, which open which uh, open as a reaction to the uh, architecture and allied uh, allied art exposition, also in 1931 at the Grand Central Galleries here in New York. The problem with this show, which we was for um, Johnson, that it created a and I quote chaotic plurality. It in it invoked just about every possible modern or modern or modernistic style. Ooh, that was bad. And uh, worst of all, actually, this show had, did have indeed, uh, yet again, representations of Diego Rivera's murals in the Mexican exhibit. Uh, oh, this is the controversy, but nonetheless. The architecture room, I'll go uh, quickly. This, this, the, the architecture room is a brainchild of, of, of Albert, Alfred Barr, where he actually then promotes the uh, the union of modern architecture and the, the mural reproductions of Diego Rivera into a international modernity. The exhibition is a exhibition of folios of black and white and color, but the important thing is this is celebrated because new German technology is able to actually cross the barrier, the, the barrier of color reproduction, and thus these reproductions are hailed as, as a technological advancement. The underscoring of technology over subject matter, which accomplishes uh, accomplishes the detailed description of Rivera's color palette, palette, abandons the social character of Rivera's work and inserts fully within capitalist consumption. Rivera's production clearly inhabits a modern interior, but Johnson deploys every possible means to actually then negate the modernity of Rivera's in a modern interior. I'll go quick. If one could argue, this in terms of, if one could argue that there's a complete spatial uh, deployment of the furniture in order to block in the presentation of the murals in museistic form, it is not as a modern interior, which was actually the goal of, of the architectural, of the architecture room. It is certainly very clear in the series of memos that Johnson uh, creates for press releases, where in the very end of the very last memo, he states, also exhibited are the reproductions of Mexican frescoes by Diego Rivera. My point is that by understand, underscoring the origin, that is Mexican, national, and racial, Johnson mobilizes the idea of the nation precisely to, st to stress the unmodern condition of Rivera's work. He actually locates modernity somewhere else, not in New York, but in Mexico, because the originals of these reproductions are in Mexico and not in the United States. He also eliminates the whole condition of color, which is precisely the celebration of the technical nature of Rivera's work, of Rivera, Rivera's reproduction. 
there's a whole argument against this, but it's interesting and it just basically finalized this. To cleanse the palette, Johnson yet deploys another version of the, archi of the architecture room, this time connected to the objects 1900 and today, which was the precursor to a very famous, um, um, which I forgot already, the modern objects uh, show, the industrial objects show, where he goes so far as not as to produce yet another version of the interior show just for the press, in which he cancels if the original architecture, uh, architecture room was, was constructed through a French construction of, of, of mobulary. This is decidedly German in origin, but it's also, and I quote, a decided banishment of any uh, representation of color. In fact, he states very clearly that the, that the object should be pure white, should be clear, as clear as possible, simply and uncolored. To end it up, did the architecture room create a hybrid space, a syncretic modernity, subverting the factual universality of Eurocentric modernity? The architecture room created, I believe, a site for and of contestation. It exposed the idea of modernity and culture as, a, as something constructed, as, a uni as, an, as an uninvited guest in the modern interior, Rivera denaturalizes European international modernity and forces its narrator, Philip Johnson, to leave, leave trails, expose his tactics and strategies, and reveal his choices such, as such, as alternative and not as truth. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, after the presentations, we'll have the panel come up and uh, for comments and discussion. The next presentation is by Hania Gomez, Transposing, Imposing, Erasing the Making of Revolutionary Caracas in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Uh, Hania Gomez is architect and urban designer. She's the president founder of the Caracas-based Foundation Centro de la Ciudad and Fundación de la Memoria Urbana. She's author of the forthcoming book, El Cerrito, Tio Pontis, Masterpiece in Caracas, and of numerous articles and lectures on subjects dealing with architecture and urban culture. First, I would like to thank the school and Professor Clara, uh, Clara to invite me here. I'm very glad to be back in school. Um, I'm going to read very fast in order to, because it's a rather large. So, starting. It goes without saying the city is a great communicational media. In its deep fabric are written the messages of all epochs, everything endless generations of citizens aim to express through time. From their sum emerges its divine palimpsest, its trace of identity therefore the importance on every single urban layer. In Caracas, regrettably important historical layers were erased along the centuries. Notwithstanding the lagoons, Caracas at the end of the 20th century managed to end up with a very strong image, an image emerging from all its previous horizons, from a genius lochi anchored in the geographical qualities and the whiteness of the sunlight, and from the architectural works of a highly productive modern era. Thus, Caracas arrives to the turn of the century with a very defined urban profile. And it was exactly then, in 1998, when Hugo Chavez was elected president of the country and began what is known as the Fifth Republic, that is to say, the Bolivarian Revolution of Venezuela. Here we would like to discuss how a modern Latin American capital city, like Caracas, behaves at the event of facing for more than a decade a radical change in the national political system. What happened when it had unexpectedly to confront, all of a sudden, a revolution? It has been said that for, a, for the break of history, with history so dear to all revolutions to take place, it is crucial to start anew. It is demanded to break with the traditional expressions of the city, disrupt its languages, tear down its icons, change its codes, substitute its urban heroes, rebaptize all things known. At the beginning, everyone expected that the Chavez administration would embrace the pre-revolutionary city forms and traditions. 
leaving them untouched to start building its own, its own new socialist urban interventions, as would do all the previous Venezuelan governments and any democratic government in the world. But he did exactly the opposite. We're going to present some examples of what had happened in the Caracas urban fabric during the now 11-year-old Bolivarian Revolution and discuss the different impositions, transpositions, and the new kinds of erasings again within its urban realm. <clears throat> the other, Bill Lumière. Swiss writer Robert Walser said once, the color white, for instance, smiles. And how brightly smiles the city of Caracas when it's hit by the sunlight. White is the expression of the capital's local color. Climbing the slow, coming up from the Caribbean Sea, we are more than half, half a mile closer to the zenith. In the big valley, the light, already white at the coastline, becomes as atmospherical, diffuse, and blinding. A city builds its image in time, sometimes silent, silently. Caracas was never characterized, as were many other cities in the rest of the country or in the region, particularly Maracaibo, Venezuela's second city, for being tropically colorful. Light in the high valley is strikingly white. The sun immutable bathes it all on the landscape with its extended warm meadow like an emotion of grace. White. Midday. Caracas. The circle is for, to, to, make, to mention the tower of the cathedral. Caracas, uh, <clears throat> the Caracas architectures of all epochs, starting from the white tower of the Caracas Cathedral at their first contact with the outside, have always been irretrievably dissolved in the air, performing an optical metamorphosis within the shining atmosphere. Strong colors so typical of the popular architecture of Venezuela, um, sorry, although they are not generally the case, are also found in the capital, inevitably washed out. First, neutralized by the light and then by the rain, the most vivid colors of colors whiter and blur until they practically disappear. There is nothing to do about it. Caracas architectures, once built, plunged, are dissolved and covered right away by a transparent splendor that annoys them. Too much light dazzles and blinds. Turning off the most sumptuous of poly polychromies, things from the summer, things from the sun, who baptizes things differently in every place on, place on earth. As if someone has attended one day, white you are, and into white you will turn, the city returns inevitably to its natural color over time. That is why we say the Caracas is another time of Ciudad Luz, another kind of white city of tropic and of Caribbean, another kind of Ville Lumiere high in its valley, are flushed by the continued hazy light city of the limestone architecture. This is the basis of what we wanted to call remembering yet the Caracas theory of color. And a city laboriously produced for centuries must be said once again is the greatest of all works of art. Caracas is not Maracaibo, neither it is Willemstad, nor Quito, nor San Juan, nor Cartagena. It is neither red, nor orange, green, blue, indigo, or violet. It has its own art color psychology. It is in its urban memory is treasured a certain form of hot beauty like that of a white neo-Hispanic cathedral tower, severe, elegant, calcareous, unique, a real art in which the absence of color is not an absence of color, or at least it was so until 1998. To impose, from the Latin imponere, of in, on, and ponere, to put, to attribute falsely, Subtle, subtle as it is, the image of Caracas has been the subject of many different manipulations along its history. Um, something that is not an exclusive practice of the present, although it, in the last decade it has reached levels never before seen. The testi testimonies that either bother or support the moment that is lived are imposed, transposed, or erased within the little concert for historical reality or for the urban memory. Let's begin to review some recent urban impositions. In the middle of the last century, for example, the main monuments of the city were all painted uniformly in white, agreeing with the colors of the party of government of a time, following the recommendation of a cultural advisor. To this extreme whiteness follows as a reaction and as propaganda, both political, the carnival of colors imposed to the city, to the Caracas Historic Center to, during the current administration, allegedly trying to give back to the capital city a popular appearance, which, as we have ne seen before, it has never had. The same thing happens with the imposition, past and reason of radical changes in the urban nomenclature. The urban spaces in the capital and in the whole country are being now constantly renamed. This is always done with the same objective, to pre 
present falsely as new what already, exist, already existed and to make believe there is a new governmental world. The instability of the nomenclature Instead of being yielding locally with the passage of time and the increase of the historical conscience of the people has given a step now to a new phase where changes are being made with a frank imprudence, imp impudence and which might be even labeled as nomenclatura. Caracas as in the Chavez times, as was said Joseph Brodsky about St. Petersburg, is also a rebaptized city. Parks, plazas, avenues and monuments unexpectedly down one morning with the flaming signboards of names that the community didn't know or approve, names that now forcefully celebrate generally the indigenous revolutionary or independent wars, independence war past, in damage of the city's colonial or modern past. For instance, Guaraya Repano, for Avila, Cutagua, for uh, Columbus, Parque del Oeste, for Parque Ali Primera, Parque Esquel Zamora, for Parque El Calvario. Nevertheless, invariably, in spite of these huge expenses in new billboards, and letters of all kind made by the Bolivarian government. People keep calling common little places like they did before, a little like what happened in Leningrad during the Russian Revolution. The memory of the Caraqueños also turned into a kind of resistance of, or, of, or, of urban subversion. And the old Caracas, in spite of their impositions, keeps living in its people beyond time and political changes. Similar things happened with the restoration undertaken since 2003 we will start reviewing that very fast. Um, like a big cultural revolution, highly affected by the officialist Alcaldía de Caracas and by its heritage office, Funda Patrimonio. The main monuments of the historic center, both colonial and modern, have been all repainted in bright colors. The city unexpectedly has been trapped in a blind epidermic passion in a populist architectural carnival that threatens all its monuments. Nobody can deny the greed, the greed, the great need of restoration of the whole center of the city for years in a state of abandonment and practical ruin. But using it as an excuse to build a gigantic billboard for the revolution has been on one hand a lost opportunity and on the other a factor of cultural disinformation for the population. Uh, this is therefore a, pa a painted revolution that believes thoroughly that what sentenced Tom Wolfe in the painted word, not seeing is believing, but believing is seeing. This phrase immediately came out to our mind when we listened to the Recent public declarations of a member of a member of the sectorial office in charge of the remodeling of the 23 de Enero neighborhood, when he assured, after having changed the original polychromies of the famous modern 1950s housing complex, that this is the original color of the facades of Carlos or Raúl Villanueva's architectural project, or when some years ago the blocks of El Silencio complex were all painted in orange, and it was also said at the moment that this was the original appearance of the buildings built in the 1940s during the government of Medina Angarita, both historically false information. That is to say, what was white, well, now is orange, although it was never orange before, and what was beige is now yellow, and what was once a polygramy now is red, and so forth. Um, okay, I'll skip some of this. There are, to name some of the most famous cases, the Correo of Carmelitas, the old house of the Counts of Tobar, that was since always depicted beige tones the Church of San Francisco, traditionally of white color. This important church, for example, the second most important of Caracas following the cathedral. It was modified in 1873 by the architect Juan Hurtado Marrique to build a new facade project that would harmonize with that of the university building play right next to it. My Manrique simply said, as a good 19th century architect, I know how to mistake, imitate stone. In Caracas, but in Caracas, like in Vienna and Paris, at the turn of the 10th century, the friezes were sublime surfaces full of metamorphical will. Walls wanted to be an autonomous, autonomous of any constructive logic and as embroidered surfaces aimed to be applied to the architecture as panels decorated by the architect's hand. The white walls of the Esquina de San Francisco simulated authentic ashlar pilasters and cornices made of stone and dramatized by the chiaroscuro in architecture parlant. Because of this, the string renovation executed in 2004, erasing the trace of the false ashlars and painting the shirt in gray and yellow, and the southern facade of the parochia curia in red that looks extracted from a vulgar catalog of painting for exteriors in nothing that but the conceptual denial 
of the 1873's project and the antithesis of the temple superb and austere interiors. Of the polemic transformation of the images of these two important landmarks of the Caracas Historic Center, the impact over the public opinion was so big that the program, instead of being rectified, received a stronger support from the Alcaldía to continue in the same line. From the now follow the facades of the Palacio de las Academias and of the old Palacio de la Exposición, both before in white and fair gray, and now perfectly tuned with the recently painted tones of the contiguous Church of San Francisco. The Church of El Sagrado Corazón de Jesús, once in a cream color and now a sky blue. The Panteón Nacional, originally beige and siena, and now in pink and green. The Consejo Municipal de Caracas, originally also in a cream tone and repainted in gray and in a strong canary yellow. The public polemic reappeared in 2006 when Funda Patrimonio finished, as we mentioned before, the restoration process of El Silencio Complex, 1942, a vast urban renewal that introduced new housing and retail neighborhood in the center of the city. Uh, after many years of decay, heavy modification practiced to the great majority of the apartments and a very bad maintenance Funda Patrimonio undertook an ambitious restoration project. Lamentably, <coughs> after the restoration came the well-known change of color of the block facades, modifi modifying totally the perception of the urban space. With the general public rejection of this action, everyone turned to the architect's daughter, Paulina Villanueva, who publicly declared that the color that her father applied to the building was originally a, ton a ton sub ton similar to that of, the, of an eggshell. But her advice wasn't heard and the buildings were covered in a tangerine like tone. So on, este, with renovated strength, the changes continued. The Teatro Nacional, originally in beige and cream, was painted with a striking brick color that plus was sponged. Besides the old glass and iron marquee or its main entrance hasn't been put back in place. Meanwhile, three of the main architectural monuments of the most important 19th century part of Caracas, the Parque del Calvario, that is to say, the Arco de la Revolución, the tunnel, you see the, the changes, the tunnel of El Calvario, and the Chapel of Lourdes have left behind the snowy shades that made them once detached as the sculptures amidst the green forest of El Calvario Hill to become now the first polychromous, the second covered absurdly la queue, and the third orange according to the unilateral decisions taken by Funda Patrimonio's restoration team, decisions that a technical school of communal artisans quickly trained by the Alcaldía in the neighboring communities rushed to execute, raising here also, by the way, many of the original bulls are architectural detailing. This transforming fanaticism and the desire to impose a new image ended up in, the go going, be in going beyond the surfaces of the patrimonial structures to reach the close by urban fabric. Uh, after the conclusion of the new Nuevo Circo de Caracas restoration, where the new Moorish bull ring was painted with the strong primary yellows and reds, colors already political conscious because they are the colors of the actual government's party. Um, Immediately, the Alcaldía Caracas, to whom must have exceeded a good reserve of yellow painting from the last restorations in the surroundings, started to paint the same master yellow on buildings of all epochs, covering with a repetitive monochromy what before was the genuine expression of the architectural local languages. To end this list, we still have to mention what happened to the modern housing complex of the 23 de Enero, Villanueva, 1950s. As a paradigm of modernity, the facades of these popular housing units were converted into big abstract murals based in a color plane composition commissioned to artists like Mateo Manaur and Victor Valera, who also collaborated with Villanueva in the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas. In spite of the area's general decay, the composition lasted until now. In January 2010, a great deal of the facade of the blocks were changed to plain red and white combinations. According to the testimony of writer Adriana Villanueva, the architect's granddaughter, this rojo rojito is the emblematic color of the revolutionary government. My souvenir is that the 23 de Enero facades have never been of a single color, but always covered with polychromies. This was their charm. In the archives of Fundación Villanueva, we found some photos of the Banco Obrero dating from when the 23 de Enero opened, and there was the red, but all along with the blue, the green, the orange, the green. On the country now, the vibration brought by the game of color of the artist's works is no longer there, Sometime, something quite distant of, distant of the spirit of Villanueva's modernity. 
Regarding on these cases of repeated impositions done by the Alcaldía de Caracas, the Instituto del Patrimonio Cultural, the maximum heritage authority of the country, still keeps silence. Transpositions, to transpose from the Latin transpondere, I think I'm going just to show you the images because it's too long, to put in a different place, to remove, to change place. Well, this um, part of the paper was going to show um, the transposition of objects, important cultural objects in the city to change their meaning. One, the first case is the case of Maria Leonza, a 1950s sculpture that was placed at the entrance, uh, northern entrance of the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas to act as the, um, the, the, the carrier of the Olympic flame next to the stadiums. That was their its original pedestal and its original location where the architect placed it. Um, what is this? I don't know, I have time to read or no? Okay, so this is the case of the statue was tried to be moved. Uh, this is the original statue in, in its decay state before restoration. And at the moment of restoration when it broke, um, yes, because it's, it's not a stone, it's artificial stone. Then uh, the government decided to try to put it in a new place. So the in indigenous past and the cultural meaning of the, of the statue would change being removed from the university city and be placed in a more important location in the city. This is the Plaza Venezuela, and the second was the Plaza de los Museos, by the, by, by the citizens and the people of Fran Caracas who so strongly defended the, the original site that they couldn't move it, but they even uh, built a pedestal in the Plaza de los Museos, which now is demolished, of course. So the, there is a clone statue that is standing now in the original site, and the original one is restored, uh, waiting endlessly to be put back in place. A second for, uh, case of transposition we showed last year in, at Fitch Colloquium is the Museum Leander at the Par Roberto Burlemar's Parque del Este. This is the project that is started to be built in the Lake Nine, destroying absolutely its natural original design and spirit. And this is the situation now. Uh, construction has stopped, uh, fortunately, because of uh, the, the park was listed last year in the watch list 2010, and also because of our participation here last year in Fetch Colloquium. But this is the situation, and the still the hole is open. Well, and another kind of thing that happened is that this year is the bicentennial of the independence war in Venezuela, and the government wanted to put a monumental obelisk in the Bol Plaza Bolivar that is only a few meters less than that of Buenos Aires, but can you imagine the size and scale of this object? In the And, and it started construction, but construction has stopped, but the, the works are open air like they are now. That is uh, near to the chancery and the old um, palace of the, of, the, of, the, of the town hall. And then, well, erasing is very, is very easy for the images you would know. All the Columbus statues of the city have been uh, torn down. This is the uh, 1895 Columbus statue that uh, was placed um, originally in the top of the pavilion of Venezuela in the Columbus um, Exposition in Chicago. That was the statue. Then the claim from the indigenous ethnias to take the statue away. They finally got it. And this was last week when another hero of the Federal Revolution which was placed on top of the 19th century place. Same happened with the other Columbus Monument, Monument de Colón el Golfo Triste, which was also a very important artist from the 19th century. It was a statue, and that was the vandalism against it. The statue is kidnapped somewhere. We don't know where it is now. And this is the actual situation of the monument. No comments. Thank you very much.
Uh, now we'll have uh, Ingrid Olivo. Uh, her presentation is Questioning cultural, cultural Heritage Preservation in Puerto Rico Through the Case of Ponce. Uh, Ingrid is urban planning PhD candidate at Columbia University, and her current research focuses on the interface between preservation, planning, and disaster policies in secondary historic cities of the Caribbean. Uh, first of all, thanks to Clara and her team. I actually feel like a prophet in my own land since I'm one of the house students. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to present my work. Uh, this is what I will try to do in the following 20 minutes, if my speed allows. And uh, bear with me first uh, with the force, force slides which are a bit preparatory to what's going to come. I am trying to address in this work how in Puerto Rico cultural heritage has been, has moved forward to a hybrid self-identification and respect for all cultural mass manifestations, but this has embedded perilous vacuums. Preservation has been the domain of the Institute of Puerto, de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, which is a public entity set up after the island obtained a Commonwealth status in 1952. And although some of the tasks of this institution are under the National Park Service supervision, the relative autonomy and centralized mandate of the ICP, I argue it's a very important power negotiation in a sphere that is, has been conflicted and it's still into definition, which is the recognition of a validated island identity, both by people in the island and abroad, Puerto Ricans and the diaspora, and by foreign rulers. And also, I argue that this entails a redistribution of resources and agency. The research questions guiding this presentation are basically subsumed in two. The first is the national scale level of the policy, how did this preservation the, of cultural heritage developed by an island institution? This is the first chunk that I'm going to cover, hopefully. The second part that I'm going to cover refers to Ponce. I am asking how does this translate to a secondary city that aimed to be the cultural and the capital at a point in time, and that despite the decline uh, that happened for the most part during the 20th century, still is portrayed as a proud, unique place that wants to reclaim this splendor uh, and power through planning policies. And the, the third question is actually related to the second, which is specifically what are the vacuums that I foresee in this case, which is an example for cities in the global south or how municipalities, how second tier uh, cities try to achieve autonomy, development through preservation and actually through planning. I have used a combined methodology of four quantitative methods, an embedded case study, Puerto Rico is my case, and the subunit of analysis is Ponce. I conducted archival research for three years in situ and online, and in that archival research, I have contrasted technical works, such as planning documents, unpublished policy documents, medical records, and so on, with uh, non-technical works, such as uh, cartoons, postcards, songs, literary works, in, a, um, in an attempt to contrast two ways of addressing the same problem, as academics 
or intellectuals or policy makers and as the general lay citizens or representatives of the lay citizens might do. I also conducted direct observation for five months, monthly in Ponce, mainly in Ponce and in San Juan, and I dedicated myself to observe interactions of groups, trying to be as less perturbing as possible. I also visited cultural venues and so on. And the fourth method that I have used is visual sociology. I am extracting data or presenting conclusions from images and also from text in the images. Uh, my framework of analysis for both cases, first the national policy and second the city policy, is in three historical time periods that I think structure life in Puerto Rico, to say it bluntly, how, it, uh, how the colon Spanish colonial framework created a set of assumptions, institutions, policies, and how that has influenced my topic subsequently when the US uh, took over into 19, 18, 1898 to 1952 in a state in which first it was military and second it was under civil sovereignty. And then the third stage that I'm going to look at is the Commonwealth era from 1952 to 2009. So uh, during the Spanish colony, cultural domination sustained the conquest and colonization of Puerto Rico I am very helpful to some of the presenters who yesterday uh, advanced this discussion because what I'm trying to summarize here is that the a notion of habitus as defined by Bourdieu was established since the beginning of colonization. And in this notion of habitus, there was a um, social, economic, cultural hierarchy based on nation of origin, based on race and ethnicity, gender and religion. This notion still permeates what today is deferred, defended as culture or not. Uh, I'm going to return back to this in my case study. But in that hierarchy, it was Spanish born citizens who were of occupating the top and uh, disregarding their fellow citizens born in the Americas and even more so people of color, as you know, the extreme genocide of indigenous peoples took place, and subsequently after that, and slavery of Africans took place. And this social hierarchy is still present, although modified, in the understanding of culture, uh, which is basically my second argument. This notion of whitening, uh, preference for Hispanophilic architecture, ways of portraying culture, and so on, gender, class, and religion, define social hierarchy and also embryonic notions of local identity when in the 19th century there were struggles in the island to become a nation, an independent nation. And this influences what Apadurai has called the politics of remember and the politics of forgetting. In, 19, in 1898, Americans took over after the, civil, after the Spanish American War, Puerto Rico became Puerto Rico and it was an unincorporated territory that basically meant that the colonial status was transferred from one nation to the other nation. And uh, in this new scheme, even the local elites who had discriminated against their own people were facing discrimination based on the usual suspects, you know, religion, race, ethnicity, country of origin, gender, and language. I'm going to stop here on two postcards, which I think are very representative of that early period of US military sovereignty. Postcards at that time are very useful, uh, of that time are very useful, because it has a, it's a moment in which both photography and post mail were reaching massive use. So they are very important as a means of communication for travelers and also as historical documents. And uh, you see the, clear contrast in the top image of uh, white military newcomers resting in a camp where tame nature has been given way to some comfort and below you start to see the representation of Puerto Ricans as natives, as deprived. In this case it is a group of very unhappy children against an exuberant vegetation that are cast as powerless, that they lack basic needs, not even stockings, forget shoes, 
So uh, this is going to play out in the following policies of the century. Uh, I want to stop now on how federally promoted assimilation prompted rejection mechanisms. For example, English was, became the official medium of instruction in public schools. And this decision was extremely unpopular, as this cartoon shows. Actually, Spanish became central later on to delineate what Puerto Ricanness man, meant, as has been argued by several scholars like Duani, Davila, and Barreto. In this case, you see Uncle Sam hitting a nail vigorously with a hammer that is called English language, and the nail is called Americanization. But instead of penetrating the intact pavement, the nail is bending. And uh, at the same time, Puerto Rico, uh, to the left, is represented by a poor and disdaining man who actually has the face of one of the autonomy fighters, the father of future governor Munoz Marin, who's actually sitting, instead of a lush background of a wild forest like in the past postcard, or in a tame nature contest like the American camp in a very de developed urban setting, you know, in the doorstep of a uh, well-to-do building. In this period of transition of American takeover, uh, there was a very quick development of a sugar-based economy in which American firms actually challenged the supremacy of Creoles. So, in parallel to a process of cultural assimilation, there is this process of economic invasion, political restructuring, and so on. And by the 30s, this initial framework of governance takes a very different shift because there's a big decline of sugar. Sugar reaches, sugar reaches a very high price before and during the Second World War, but after that, the prices collapse. So that sends the Puerto Rican economy into a big crisis. There are also several disasters that worsen the situation. So this is a moment in which rural decay and crisis prompt pro-independent struggles, armed independent struggles, but also they prompt the notion that the early colonizer, that who lived in the interior mountains of the area, the island isolated of white heritage, and the Hivoro, which is a rural peasant, they both gain strain, strength as identity cornerstones in the moment of crisis. And actually that mimics what some of the 18th century nationalist, nationalist movements in Europe were doing when forging nation states. Urban intellectuals, regardless of partisan policy, politics, idealize rural folk traits, pristine nature, ancient local myths and folklore which some of them were actually invented traditions. The response to this crisis is the New Deal, officially, and I argue that there's also a response in terms of extreme repression. The New Deal came to Puerto Rico, and it actually set up a comprehensive planning paradigm that embodied a technology of domination over nature and people. Through this paradigm, the image of the United States was redirected from a distant and extractive colonial power to a regulatory state engaged with everyday life concerns in time of havoc. Electrification, for example, public housing, investment in public infrastructure, all that took place. At the same time, because of the independent struggles, harassment, martial law, and uh, policies such as the gag law took place. The gag law, I want to stop briefly, it's known as the Ley Mordaza, and by this law it was proper to jail people for having patriotic manifestations, for hanging the Puerto Rican flag, for example, for speaking about independence. So there are records of some people that were jailed for attending mass because the priest had a, an overt nationalist tone, for example. So this lasts for a period of time, but what is evident of the, from this moment is that there's a need to address patriotic sentiments and cultural sensibilities through a more inclusive and tolerant compromise, which is negotiated in the Commonwealth from 1952 onwards. Uh, a decisive figure takes 
charge here, Luis Munoz Marin, and he, in this project, there are two aims at the same time. The first is modern economic development, industrialization through tax cuts, uh, through tax exemptions, institutional reform, tourism, and migration. Of this, we spoke yesterday. Uh, and I think that this part of the agenda has, it, it took place first in Puerto Rico. It's one of those transnationalism that was announced in Puerto Rico and has been experienced subsequently in the rest of the continent. And from that strategy, what is very clear is a large project called Operation Bootstraps. I'm not going to stop into that because it's fairly well known. It was showcased as a development policy uh, for other countries. What is also interesting for me and is less known is that Munoz Marin had in mind that there was a need to create an ontological security, as Anthony Giddens has defined. That is to say, in a period of rapid change and stability, we need to hold on to some values that make sense to our human experience. For him, this could take place if developing education, appreciation of the arts, and cultural heritage preservation. And this project that is the result of that thinking is called Operation Serenity. As part of that project, uh, the ICP, the institute I'm going to talk about, was developed. So uh, I probably have to skip this, uh, but these are some of the quotes about uh, that Munoz Marin uh, explained his thinking. And I uh, look at the words, how Puerto Ricans want to continue being kind and tranquil, you know, serenity. They want to take things nicely and politely. In the moment of modern civilization, they do not want to be upset by modernity. Another quote is that, as, this, as Puerto Rico grows in its cities and its fields, it should be the preservation of what he considers is a basic good knowledge, be one of the first achievements of urbanization instead of being one of the first victims. So we have the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña as a result of that. In 1952, when archeologists and anthropologists took place, uh, took over, and his first task was a supremely difficult task to preserve all San Juan, which was menaced by intense speculative pressures. And uh, it was a very symbolic step to affirm what is going to be culture and how are we going to intervene, intervene to preserve that, that culture. But given the pressures of the lobby, the lobby of the owners, also given the, oh my goodness, I just have two minutes left. I'm going to jump. It's a present in Latin America. Here you see, if you see all San Juan then, it's like seeing all Havana now. Uh, this is uh, announcing how, uh, how good it was to get gentrified all, the, uh, all San Juan. And this is, uh, I think, the conclusion of this is that official Hispanophilia took over. In the crisis of modernity, Operation Bootstrap proved a failure, the Commonwealth status take over again, and the links between identity and culture come back to public policy and to the media. Jumping over that, preservation, I'm trying to compare here, preservation in the 60s and the 90s, how some of the assumptions of the built environment that is to be preserved, the Spanish environment, is uh, still like the facade. And Ponce, well, oh yeah, my goodness, in those two minutes, let's see what I can do. Ponce was a small coastal farming settlement that rapid in two centuries later became the main hub of uh, exports when sugar and coffee exports uh, both boom in the city. And uh, in this quick, uh, there was a quick and even process of development, a very stark small elite had a developed part of the city that wanted to become the capital. This you can see in the bottom in this square, which is one of the quintessential places of the elite. And uh, here I'm trying to show the hierarchy of the streets, the, the stratification of what of this city that portrays itself as a proud, as the capital to be. And, um, and this is the other side of Puerto Rico, of Ponce, that it's not developed, developed in the memorialization of the city. This was, for the most part, what constitutes Ponce, but, uh, but it's not reflected in the narratives put by the local elites in the 19th century. When Americans come, Ponce loses power. Americans reconfirm San Juan. Foreigners who, ha 
uh, start to control the representations of Ponce instead of the local elite Creole. So they have representations of the city that are balanced, some are conventional, others are pejorative colonialist. And uh, of this, we're going to see briefly these three postcards. In the top one, it's announcing that this city is like the best uh, economic arena of Ponce by an American. In the second one, you see these archetypical snapshots of the city in which uh, to the left, the very elitist snobby casino and the Ponce port to the bottom are contrasted with the very uh, primitive aesthetics in which Afro-Puerto Ricans are used again as the native. So this is another representation of Ponce by foreigners. So this is what I'm trying to portray to you. Wrap up. And uh, in this crisis of modernity of the 50s of Corco and uh, the collapse of sugar, fishing, airports, and so on, Ponce becomes a dismal failure as if it had been bombed. So the response is to struggle for the city to become an autonomous municipality. A whole planning process is set up by the major, starting with preservation as the emblem of it, although it's a much larger process. So in this last part of the 20th century, in the last 20 years, there's a change in preservation going to a more commodified approach, there is a deregulation of who's involved, there are grassroots initiatives, intellectuals, the media, so there's a, a decentralization, I argue, and a much complex scheme of governance, and uh, from this holistic idea to conquer autonomy, uh, preservation is one of the key emblems, and uh, this plan, and this, what this municipality did, actually change power relations in the islands after the law. So uh, the last, uh, what is, sorry, this is the major of the city, dreaming that Ponce on the top becomes San Juan. So this is again this idea of, you know, struggling to have a, a stronger place in the, in the national, in the island. And uh, my conclusions is that preservation has recognized rejected cultural signifiers and has actually redistributed resources, which Fraser and Honneth argue are two bases of social justice. So recognition and redistribution have taken place, I argue, but still they have taken place in ways that are insufficient and that are open to arguable critiques, such as being inefficient, reified, uh, non-participatory, and so on. We can discuss that in the break. Preservation in Ponce follows island-wide trends, but it also creates pioneering special processes, which I think are useful to study for second-tier cities in the global south. And uh, preservation, I think, is a special mechanism which creates a sense of self-identification, undermining the satisfaction with the US rule. And uh, the last argument is that it must engage in the quest for empowerment related to recognition, autonomy, and development. And muchas gracias. Okay, our final uh, presentation is uh, uh, Juan Miguel Canay. Uh, the resurgence of the barrios as socio-political territories in the transnational space of the contemporary city of Buenos Aires. Um, he obtained his PhD at UCLA in 2008. He's assistant professor at the Department of Geography and Regional Studies at the University of Miami. Uh, his research explores how intertwined processes of urbanization and globalization shape contemporary social life in the Americas, with a focus on the territorial policies and politics of the redevelopment in globalizing cities. His work engages with critical urban theory, the spatiality of inequality, regional city and neighborhood planning, and the places of the middle classes in the contemporary city. Okay, thank you, Clara, for putting uh, this great event together and for allowing me to participate in this very interesting session. As a geographer, I'd like to, perhaps with my presentation, complement this largely anthropological transnational imagination that we've been talking about uh, for the past two days. And what I'd like to achieve, in particular, in this presentation is to 
somehow show how that, what we call the transnational, is largely constituted in the space of contemporary, dense, diverse, heterogeneous, and complex cities. And while at the same time, much what happens in those dense, heterogeneous, and complex cities, even what we may be identifying as purely based or localist politics, is also largely constituted by the transnational, either as a reaction, as a form of trying to cope with it, as a form to trying to engage with it in, um, uh, in more beneficial terms. So that's, that's what my presentation will be today, and about that's how I interpret what some may see as a resurgence of localism in the city of Buenos Aires. That's what I call the resurgence of the virus. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to try to show why. Uh, OK. So the um, theoretical motivation uh, for this work is to try to show that that what I was saying that could be identifying as purely local, such as processes of sub-municipal decentralization or neighborhood empowerment are not just or are not only functions of social movements and their interaction with the local state, with city governments, but they are also the result, the product of multiple extra-local processes occurring at multiple scales and carried out by various diverse state and social actors. Um, and what is interesting about this is that in this era of deep urban globalization, uh, unprecedented mobility and transnationalism, transnationalism, some local spaces seem to be gaining or regaining significance as social political territories, territories for both the regulation of urban affairs as territories to acquire voice, to acquire political representation in um, the processes of decision making of how those uh, processes should be uh, guided. So, the example that I'm going to be discussing today uh, is uh, based in the city of Buenos Aires, a city of three million people, the capital of Argentina. And I'm looking at the localist neighborhood movements that have occurred among the middle classes of the city, particularly in the period that starts with Argentina, Argentina's crisis. God, I can't even pronounce my own country's name right in English. <laughs> with, with what started with... Um, Argentina's crisis, neoliberal crisis, the crisis that occurred largely because of the neoliberal policies that Argentina um, pursued throughout the 1990s, a crisis that erupted in late 2001 and continued for two, three years till 2003 or so. So um, within the social movements that emerged during this period between 2001 and 2003, I focus on one, one that uh, a social movement that tried to uh, pursue the advancement of one reform that had been applied earlier, and that's the sub-municipal decentralization of the city into districts or what it was called what is called localist comunas. And uh, within that social movement, I particularly focus on one territorial-based framework of collective action, and that is the focus that those mobilized social actors in the pro-comunas movement placed on the barrios, the barrios of the city, barrio in Spain, for those of you who speak Spanish know that barrio simply means neighborhood, but in the city of Buenos Aires, this is also an official geography. It's a subdivision of the city into well-known places with names that have supposedly historical origins and traditions. So I'm going to be looking at how these frameworks, these territorially based frameworks of collective actions, the barrios, were deployed as discursive constructs to frame issues and to motivate political mobilization and to try to pursue a common interest between the diverse actors mobilized. I'm going to finish my presentation on a relatively um, uh, negative note. This is Argentina, after all. Uh, the limited reach of the reforms, I'm going to say, needs to be understood. It's very limited. We have to understand that the Comunas was a relatively failed reform. It's still not applied. And what I'd like to try to interpret is why has been such a um, weak reform or why the, the social movement did not succeed in all of its goal. And I'm going to place um, those short comments in, in, into, uh, try to explain them by both the ongoing city national tensions occurring in the post-neoliberal Argentina and those struggles taking 
place beyond the scale of the neighborhood, place in, taking place between the scale of the city and the scale of the nation. And I'm also going to look at some inherent weaknesses to this localist framework of the Barrio Comuna in an era of ongoing transnationalization for the city. So just to start with a little bit of background and what happened in the 1990s, Argentina was the, of the most thoroughly reformed capitalist economies in the world. Um, the um, coalition that was established around the election of President Menem in 1999 was able to carry out reforms that even exceeded the, the, um, the regional context. Argentina neoliberalized even more than Mexico, even more than Chile, arguably, during this period. And uh, what is less known about this well-known process of neoliberalization of Argentina is the, how um, state territoriality was deployed to both pursue and support these macroeconomic reforms and how concurrently with those well-known macroeconomic interventions such as the convertibility um, currency that tied the Argentine peso one to one to the dollar, how next to those macroeconomic interventions, neoliberal Argentina embarked in what we call a process of state restructuring, a reshaping, a retooling of the territorial scaffolding of the Argentine state needed to support for a long term such mar market centric social order. The Argentinian state restructure, rescale in multiple directions. Uh, on one direction, the uh, Argentine state went up to the supranational scale. Argentina eagerly joined Mercosur with Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay, but with very different motivations from uh, those of Brazil. Brazil was looking to uh, insert itself as a global player. What Argentina was trying to do is to liberalize its market. By joining Mercosur, there was one way of liberalizing the Argentinian market and to establish what is called a conditioning framework. If the um, market was open and allowed imports not only from Brazil and other Mercosur partners, but from all over the world, it was not because Argentina wanted to do so, but it was because it was stipulation of Mercosur. So this was used as a conditioning framework for liberalizing the local economy. At the same time, Argentina embarked in a thorough process of subnational devolution and administrative decentralization. So many of the educational, social, health services formerly provided by the Argentine state where the responsibility for those services was transpassed to uh, provincial and municipal neighborhood, um, uh, provincial and local um, governments without the necessary budgets and to free up the budget of the Argentine state uh, from those uh, obligations. So there was that sub-national scale from, uh, uh, from top to, uh, at, at top down, not just fr uh, from below, but also uh, from the scale to, to scales below it. Finally, there's an, a form of externalization of state, f of previously um, known as, as state functions, what I call the outside in. The Argentine state frees itself up from um, its former functions of being um, an originator of economic development, a starter of uh, investment trends, and uh, that functions are transpassed to the outside, to transnational capital. So it's no longer the Argentinian state who is the main originator of investments and economic um, innovation, but now that function is assumed by, transna by transnational capital. And this is seen clearly in Argentina's primary economic space, metropolitan Buenos Aires, and particularly the city of Buenos Aires, which becomes a prominent space for transnational investment and for transnationalization. Um, a paradigmatic example of these trends can be found in Puerto Madero, a case of state-sponsored redevelopment, a mega project that embodies the city building logics of this neoliberal regime. Actually, a mega project in which both city government and the national government of Argentina were involved. A corporation was created by joint ownership, joint ownership, joint, of, joint ownership of uh, both city and national governments, and it was deployed to um, redevelop this area. Uh, it's not just Puerto Madero, though. Similar projects take place throughout the city in what um, Graciela Silvestri and Adrián Gorelick call a policy of fragments uh, or uh, isolated site redevelopment projects 
uh, largely speculative and largely with the participation of foreign capital that can be framed within um, an entrepreneurial climate of uh, profit seeking as the main goal for urban planning. An example of the consequences that such form of partial or side-based redevelopment um, bring about can be found in the example of the Avasto area. Uh, this is um, an area uh, centered around what used to be um, Buenos Aires' uh, main um, wholesale market for fruit and produce. Um, and this is an area that was redeveloped mainly in terms of the uh, principal site. This is what you see in the picture, the, um, the main market facility, this uh, beautiful Art Deco building, which, is now, which now hosts a shopping center. And uh, two uh, high-rise uh, towers were built uh, behind it in the same site. Um, this is largely an upper middle class development targeting that audience, but it was um, the redevelopment didn't look at other spaces that were ancillary to this main structure, other smaller deposits, uh, other um, um, structures around the market that were left to decay and they were largely um, squatter and occupied and still today um, house a very disadvantaged population. So we see in the Avasto area a new juxtaposition of wealth and uh, poverty, as well as um, transnationalization in cultural terms. Uh, this Avasto area is uh, largely Jewish. There's a large Jewish concentration here in the Avasto. There's new um, immigrant population as well, lar uh, primarily Peruvian. And so we see here as um, what is happening throughout the city, um, how the city becomes uh, more complex, more unequal, more heterogeneous, and it has, how it starts to uh, bringing together complex and problematic juxtapositions of transnational wealth and metropolitan exclusion. This all has been very well studied. There's a very good book by Maria Carmen on the Abasto, only in Spanish, it's called um, Las Trampas de la Cultura, I believe. Um, Saida Mushi has written also a great book, La, La Ciudad Global, where she discusses Puerto Madero, Abasto, and many other projects that have taken place during the 1990s in this policy of fragments um, uh, propitiated by the Argentine state. So this is a rather familiar story by now, by now of what happened in the 1990s. But the story continues. A decade has passed since then, after the Argentine crisis of 2001 that is now being understood as one of the biggest failures of market centric policies in the world. Perhaps until the foreclosure crisis here in the United States, the largest neoliberal failure up to date. Um, again, much of this has been discussed in terms of national politics and macroeconomics, but what I'm interested in is the urban implications of uh, this failure and its reactions. What has happened in terms of of the urban in this post-neoliberal period. So what is interesting is that during uh, the height of the protests between 2001 and 2003, we have new political actors taking up to the streets. Uh, the formerly acquies acquiescent urban middle classes are seen side by side with popular movements and those disenfranchised by the neoliberal regimes. And of course, the middle classes were rec rec uh, claiming what every other, everyone else was reclaiming, a change in policy, uh, a better economy, regaining their jobs. But uh, mixed in with those claims, there were claims for different forms of city making. Um, what um, we see here is um, social actors acting in new forms of direct action politics. We see the appearance of what it was called Asambleas Barriales or neighborhood assemblies. We see demands both to the national government and to the city government for more transparency and more accountability, more rights to participate in uh, deciding the direction that urban development was taken. And what's interesting about these mobilizations, although they never reached the volume that popular mobilization took, these mobilizations continued well after the stabilization of national politics marked by the election of President Kirchner in 2003. Those mobilized middle class actors continued mobilized, continued with their protest, with their urban based protests. So 
they demand uh, more decentralization to city government, and they're increasingly based their claims on the local scale, on neighborhood politics. So what we see also among these um, social actors, an unprecedented interest for the institutions of municipal government in the city of Buenos Aires. Mechanisms of city part citizen participation in planning, batch budgeting, and also government-sponsored cultural activities, of which there have been many in Buenos Aires. We see also uh, new forms of collective actions, new rep what it's called, what the literature called repertoires of collective action. And what we see is a, an interesting back and forth between collaborative, um, participa uh, collaborative mobilizations as citizen participation in spaces sponsored by the state to neighborhood activism, um, uh, street protest, and so on. Uh, this participation, as I said, is it's clearly a middle class participation, not only because of the sociological characteristics of, of the actors involved, uh, largely middle income professionals, largely uh, people with ownership and, and housing stability, but also because where they take place. Most of the mobilized neighborhoods, uh, most of the mobilizations and the, the um, the organizations that we see in, uh, in these new politics are based, have a territorial base in traditional middle class areas of the city, such as, for example, Kaushita. Um, oh my god, two minutes left. Okay. Uh, <laughs> amazing how fast it goes, right? Okay. So, um, as I said, the Comunes uh, uh, redistricting was of the in institutions that these actors focused on. And uh, what I wanted to explain, hopefully, I have the time, is that. This localism was, in a not neglectable part, a reaction to the directions that city de urban development had taken during the previous era, during the 1990s, to stress nationally oriented growth. Um, so what you see here, the four uh, first uh, concerns of mobilized actors, the mobilized actors stated, are basically a reaction to a crisis, reactions to downward social mobility. But the bottom three, what you see there, are also reactions to these new forms of transnationally oriented growth and the resulting social spatial inequalities. Uh, mobilized actors want to have the comunas to have more control over crime and insecurity, the fear of these multiple others, such as those that appear around the Abasto, uh, to, to try to deter uh, consequences of overdevelopment that they associate with speculative mega projects that had appeared in the 1990s and that continued being developed in the 2000s, and also to try to manage processes of gentrification, neighborhood change, and residential displacement co caused by the expansion of cultural, entertainment, and leisure facilities catering to the growing mass of foreign tourists and international visitors. Um, however, um, as I said, uh, the Comunes became a law and um, an unprecedented uh, process of citizen participation. Uh, those that were mobilized achieved many things, one of their main victories is that the Comunas map was drawn based upon the um, geography of the barrios. So um, previously existing geographies of um, the deli service delivery uh, that were uh, drafted by state actors were discarded, and the Comunas now represent, have the t uh, were drawn based upon the, t the, um, the territory of the city's 46 barrios. You see some of the barrios, the largest barrios, were able to keep their own comunas. For example, the barrio of Palermo became Comuna 14, Cabachito became Comuna 6. Some of the smaller uh, barrios, such as those downtown, were grouped together into one comuna. Yet their um, basic territory was uh, kept together and only contiguous barrios were joined in the same comuna. Um, let's see. However, uh, this part that I wanted, to, maybe I don't have much time to talk about uh, the failures or shortcomings of this reform. What I should say is that the Comunas still largely exist in paper. The first election of representative has been postponed until 2011. It hasn't happened, mainly because of delays in opposition mainly from city mayors. And I try to understand uh, why this impetus, this um, achievements that happened in the first phase in 2006 couldn't car carry through. And I find uh, um, three reasons. One is that uh, 
municipal politics have shifted in Buenos Aires. In 2007, Mauricio Macri was changed. He's not interested in decentralization. He's more interested in contesting the, uh, polit the national politics of uh, Kirchner. Um, but also, we see um, a decay in social mobilization. There's difficulties in coordinating multiple actors with diverse motivations, and this idea of the barrio as a framework of um, collective action also begins showing some of its weaknesses. I tried to explain why. Unfortunately, I created this in a Mac, so it's not showing here. <laughs> so, um, and what's happening is that the barrios become clearly a fiction. The supposed homogeneity found in the barrio and this, the, um, the yearning for a common social good articulated around that space becomes clearly impossible with the ongoing transnationalization and differentiation of urban space. Um, upscale real estate projects create their own sense of place, combining vernacular histories with transnational sensitivity. There's this mic micro barrios of those living in those uh, real estate projects, which in a way translates suburban logics of gated communities into urban gated communities in the fabric of the old city. Uh, there's more and more international tourism uh, and international visitors uh, that vie with locals for housing and accommodation and an increasingly unaffordable city, and I have the very last one. And uh, so uh, that, that kind of fiction of long-term residency in a barrio and I, identification of the actor with the territory becomes uh, less and less an, of a reality for more people. Um, I'm going to shut up now, and I'm just going to leave you to read the conclusions so we can proceed. If you're interested in this, you can read my conclusions. If you want, you can ask me questions uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, um, in addition to the crisis of space, we have a crisis of time. And I have enough comments to go for another, uh, uh, to use up everybody's time. And I have uh, enough questions for all of the panelists that they will never be able to answer in the two minutes that each of them has. But let me just uh, give some overall impressions and make some specific comments about the presentations. Uh, I should actually uh, prefix with the, uh, identifying myself. I, I teach urban planning at uh, Hunter College, and I've, um, uh, I, I am also an editor of uh, Latin American Perspectives, and this is my quick advertisement. We're doing a, a theme issue on urban Latin America. Uh, I will have, I do have um, prospectuses around, and they'll be available to everybody in the back, and invite you to submit in English, Spanish, uh, or Portuguese. Um, one by one, well, I think there are, there are three important common elements in all of the presentations. One, and to dealt with in various different degrees, uh, and one is the importance of understanding the cities and culture and preservation within the context of colonialism and uh, the U.S. role in, in Latin America. Uh, this is brought out uh, in the first presentation. Patricio de Leal talks about the, the, the um, contest over uh, it, within the Museum of Modern Art and um, uh, um, Hania Gomez as well in the context of Caracas. Uh, Ingrid Olivo uh, talks about Puerto Rico and its identity vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. Uh, and uh, Miguel uh, in the context of neoliberal uh, urbanization and uh, economic development. Uh, the second theme I think that comes out is the question of revolution and uh, change in general. Um, and its relationship to national identities. And the third one is uh, what I'll call, uh, to borrow from Sharon Zukin's new book, uh, the, the Naked City, 
the politics of authenticity. Who gets to define what gets preserved, where and how? I mean, these are fundamental questions. And they're political questions, and they relate to the first two categories, which is um, uh, the colonial heritage and its meaning, um, and uh, to the question of revolution and change and what that means symbolically and in real life. Let me make just a, a few quick comments on each of the presentations. I think um, on the muralism and uh, MoMA controversy, um, I think there's another, there was another item that I, I would like to have seen in there, which is uh, the conflict between abstract art and revolutionary art, which was very much intertwined with the uh, rejection of, of Rivera's murals at Rockefeller Center uh, and the subsequent promotion by Rockefeller of uh, ab what what he termed abstract art. And, um, and I think the really critical uh, uh, question here is this question of um, uh, the universality of art. Uh, I would put it in a, in a different way, though, that, um, that sort of coincides with some of the themes touched on in the other presentations, which is the conflict between diversity and uh, monoculture in art. Uh, um, universality is another form of the monoculture uh, propounded. I mean, universality is a myth. It's a myth propounded in a cultural in cultural wars that produce monocultures that are in the image of the most powerful. Um, with uh, Hania Gomez's uh, uh, discussion of uh, Caracas, I think there's some really important questions that this brings up, uh, and many that I uh, would like to pose for further discussion. Uh, this is really where the whole question of preservation and authenticity uh, comes up. In the context of um, a revolution, um, what should be preserved and the, what does the colonial, the physical colonial city mean? Uh, does its preservation mean the preservation of colonial relations? and uh, domination. Uh, I think there is, and I think this is an important part of the presentation, there is a, a, a tendency to associate symbolism with uh, the real revolution. Um, the billboard approach to revolution. And, um, and that has produced some of the, um, some of the changes that occurred but I thought some of those changes were quite appropriate and quite interesting. Others were laughable, but um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, that I'm here to judge um, what kinds of changes need to occur. First place, Caracas is hardly a colonial city anymore. It has had one of the most neglected uh, colonial uh, infrastructure. It was, the, it was the city that was remade, remade in the image of uh, modernism after the discovery of oil. And, um, and in fact, the other question I would pose is, um, is, it, um, is it that much different than what happened in Puerto Madero? Uh, Puerto Madero and the neoliberal uh, city in uh, the enclaves in, in, in Buenos Aires, were they really any that different, than, uh, any much different than the uh, modernist image of the universal international architecture uh, that had taken over all of the major cities in Latin America uh, after the Second World War and, uh, uh, and, and before that as well. So, 
I think there's some really, really uh, critical questions here. Uh, the other question about Caracas is, you know, revolutions are, are messy. They're disorganized and they, they create havoc. Um, the real question though politically is what about the non-symbolic revolution in, in Venezuela? Where is that at? And uh, I think that is a question that can't be answered at this point uh, um, as yet. Uh, as far as Puerto Rico goes, I think um, I just want to ask Ingrid, is that place that sells ice cream still there in the Plaza de Ponce? Uh, in, in the Parque de Bomberos, in the, the Bomberos is still there. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would have liked to have seen the uh, physical examples of the preservation that you were talking about uh, and contrast it to old San Juan. Um, Maybe the physical, maybe the, the visual uh, examples aren't all that telling because maybe part of the unique approach to pr preservation in, in Ponce is that it's not strictly uh, based on physical renovation. And, and I think that's another question I want to ask all the panelists. Uh, very much focused on the physical part of preservation but the, there seems, this seems to be disjointed from the discussion of cultural preservation. And um, uh, I think we architects and planners tend to fetishize the physical without uh, uh, sufficiently giving attention to the political and the cultural. Um, and then finally on Buenos Aires, um, I have to confess, I, I am one of the uh, persons who, who commit this mistake all the time in New, with regard to New York City. When we talk about New York City, we talk about the city of New York, the eight million people living in the core. And I think Buenos Aires is one of those other cities in the world where when people talk about Buenos Aires, they always talk about the core. Uh, as I say, I, I make this mistake all the time. I always talk about, but it's pr it's because of the historic identity and the power of the core uh, and the strength of the core. But uh, the majority of population in Buenos Aires lives outside the uh, city of Buenos Aires, and it would have been nice to have a discussion uh, about the meaning of pre the core preservation of the core. Uh, for those who live outside in the periphery. Uh, and with regard to the question of participation, it would have been nice, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to hear the rest of the story, but the participation of uh, the middle class. Uh, this is a big question also in New York where many of the protests and much of the community and neighborhood-based, place-based organizing is led by uh, what are called the middle class. But quite frankly, I don't know what that is. I'm not sure what the middle class is anymore uh, because it, it is very heterogeneous um, and it includes a, a great diversity of uh, uh, people at di in different occupations, uh, different income levels, uh, and so forth. And um, there's often a surprise that the middle class is organizing, but I'm not so sure that, I think I, I, I'm more concerned about the use of that category because it is so imprecise uh, in trying to make a point or uh, demonstrate something. Um, it, it, if the categories aren't appropriate, it's gonna be difficult to make that um, make that uh, point. Uh, so uh, th these, are, these are my uh, comments, a little scattered, but um, I think overall I really appreciated the um, uh, four presentations that have a good deal of overlap and I think cover uh, some of the big questions 
uh, in a very short period of time that ran out. Thanks. So, would you come and join us for? Um, oops. Um, it, one of <laughs> um, it, it's one of the, of course, one of the stories that's crossing um, all all these exhibitions is is basically Rockefeller Center, and uh, I would uh, on that, which is a very well known story. I would just um, like to comment on the one the one page uh, letter that Rockefeller. Um, sent to Diego Rivera before the lawyers took over, and uh, basically he stated that um, he, he that they have never intervened on uh, on his wonderful art. That actually <laughs> he says the the head of Lenin is wonderfully and beautifully um, uh, executed. The problem is, uh, and Rockefeller stated that such representations are it, it's a matter of space that Rockefeller Center was a public space, and I literally, if I remember quote correctly, it's perfectly fine to have Lenin in a private space, not in the public space of Rockefeller Center, period. And that was, that's all he said. So the problem for Rockefeller at this moment, and because of other issues that rose with similar problems in the, uh, in the muralist shows, it's the problem for, for Rockefeller, in, which he was actually pretty young at this, at this time, so it's kind of interesting to uh, see his perspective, is not that it was Lenin, it was actually it was public space. Because as we see, he had absolutely no problem with Orozco's Lenin in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the new school. Um, so th this very interesting defense of muralism that, sorry, that um, it, from particular people from MoMA, um, uh, that's being launched from MoMA itself. So MoMA is not this sort of homogeneous uh, entity. I would like to thank you for your comments and to respond to them. Uh, uh, I was very del um, subtle and delicate in trying to put good photographs of uh, something that I, I dislike very much, which is the imposition of an opinion in a democratic capital. I mean, there are many people that, are, um, that know about preservation that have never been asked what what, what it, uh, their opinion of what, what's going on in this r huge restoration program in the city. So, but because uh, I was the first surprise when I put up the photographs together of the before and afters, that of course you, you have the feeling that the restored buildings look better because they were up before decay. But the thing is that the colonial core it's, it's very small. The remaining buildings are very few. Caracas is, I didn't show it in the photographs, but it's a vast, as you said, contemporary modern city made basically on gray, light, cement, and concrete. So the, 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 the color of the city is, 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 is rather light. And the few colonial and 19th century buildings are the, these that are, be, are being affected. So in terms of, of preservation, uh, the, the impact, is huge because that is what is left. It's not that, that you, you just have like a program and you are like um, improving the city, it's that there, there is a direct uh, propaganda, as you said also, uh, situation with the, the, man the manipulation of the, uh, the restorations, which is for, for, for me personally, very sad. And, and, and of course, uh, we, we look at the cultural and political part of the, of the program, but as we have done in, in our country so, so much discussions on, on the political side, I wanted to, be, to, to remain just individual 
and historical presentation of the of the, of the differ different cases. So uh, yes, they do sell ice cream in Central Ponce. Highly recommended to everybody. That's Go to that the square. Best ice cream. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Two thumbs up. Uh, so your comment about uh, working more on the physical examples of preservation versus San Juan, good point. I actually was trying to do uh, move away from that and look at the political, civic meanings of it, which is why I tried to use the cartoons and the postcards and these other ways of addressing the issue instead of the actual physicality of it, but that's going to be in it as well. And uh, yes, in Ponce, preservation, oh, actually, the, yeah, it, the concept has moved from preserving colonial architecture in Ponce to taking care of cultural heritage, which includes intangible manifestations, festivals, the celebration of afro boricua traditions, such as dance, sports, and so on. So it has moved uh, to encompass a larger understanding of culture and cultural signifiers that were rejected before. And um, it, it, it's still a contested process. For example, there's a particular uh, neighborhood, Barrio San Anton, which has been heralded as the preservation of afro boricua urbanism and uh, actually a lot of the people interviewed there, they say that but this is not Afro at all, this is the result of the overlap of poverty and exclusion. So uh, this change of meanings, and uh, what is attached to the built environment, to what is intangible and so on, I think has, has been addressed there. And it's still contested in motion, but it has. And it has moved from being something that took place in the island, like colonial architecture, to something that defines our identity, these are the terms that they use, our, uh, as something that has become personal and collective at the same time. All right, well, thank you, Tom, for giving me the chance to clarify some aspects of my presentation that have, may have been misunderstood. First, um, I didn't mean to ignore that what I was talking about was the city of Buenos Aires with the capital C, it's the city, the institutional city. I, I meant the, the three million, uh, uh, the population, with a, a population of three million, that's the capital of, of Argentina, and not the metropolitan area. And that's true, most of the people live outside the city, but also most of the people depend on the resources concentrated in the city of Buenos Aires. Metropolitan Buenos Aires is a very strong core urban region where a lot of the resources from the economic to the social cultural resources of the city are concentrated in the center. Those nine million have no say in how these resources are managed. It is only the three million voters of the city and the political institutions that manage them. So sometimes we do have to focus on the city as it happens in New York. Um, so uh, first clarification. Second clarification. Um, in my presentation, I think in the slides, as well as in my paper that I, assu I assume you read, uh, I never talked about the middle class. I always use the term in the plural case. I always talk about the urban middle classes because of this heterogeneity, this fracturing uh, that is happening and these instabilities within this in social in-between. The reason why I wanted to focus on this social in-between is because most of the studies focus, perhaps because it's easier to define the poor or the elite, but with that we miss a lot of the complexity that is happening in urban politics, the multiple actors, uh, the intervening factors. And that's why I focus so much on this territorial framework de Barrio, which I believe is, was one attempt by this diverse, heterogeneous group of actors to seek a social common interest, perhaps a place-based class interest, if you will, in, in an era where class determinations have become harder to define and more complex. Um, yet there's failures in this, in this, in this localism, this assumed homogeneity of the local territory, and that's what I wanted to talk in my conclusions that perhaps I, I didn't get about. How do, can we use what we now know about transnationalism to articulate a new sense of place, a sense of locality and neighborhood that somehow is able to coexist with this transnational realities, that, is, that does not become exclusionary and neglectful of the, all the outside in present in those neighborhoods. Questions? Yes? Uh, yeah, no, um, thank you. Uh, it would be really interesting uh, to see uh, what the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans are doing. I know the 
Thanks, May. Um, in terms of how can we relate the no uh, preservation to issues of citizenship? So I have two uh, questions for two of the presentations. Uh, the first one, Ingrid, is making um, a good effort, an interesting effort to relate this preservation with autonomy, with autonomy, the notion of autonomy I saw it, and uh, you presented, and planning. So um, here again, I find in your presentation and in your case that you're dealing with this uh, cultural difference problem. So I would like you uh, to elaborate a little bit on how is it that uh, this uh, preservation issue is allowing uh, new identities to be whether reified, as you said it, or be recreated in terms of autonomy. How are they allowing that? It's uh, opening in a space for uh, cultural differences to be recreated or reproduced. And in the presentation of Caracas, uh, um, yeah, I, I agree with the moderator. It says that it, it was, uh, your presentation was very, really rich in terms of uh, descriptive uh, images and historic um, background, but I, I, I'm, I'm keen to know uh, a little bit in, in a more theoretical way, how do you, again, elaborate these issues of uh, changing authenticity or preservation and the notion of revolutionary? Is it changing anything in terms of social processes? Is it opening a spaces for being, uh, for contest revolutionary or political processes going on? Or uh, how do you see that? Uh, oh, take take a few comments. Okay, sure. Back. Fair enough. On presentation about Caracas, uh, to follow up, I I'm not familiar with urban preservation literature or discussions, but from the in natural environmental conservation uh, debates. The political ecology literature and scholarship that is in that field has been very critical that natural environmental you know, conservationists often think that they are not political, but it's actually very political in the sense of their commitment to the past and how they, they talk a lot about the preservation, for example, of parks that have been based on disposition of indigenous land. And then now insistence on conservation is kind of like um, continuing on those dispositions rather than, so a commitment to the past rather than to a commitment to the future and change. And I'm not sure um, if, if that, those same debates that political ecology has been able to reveal in terms of natural conservationist, uh, conservationism exist in the urban conservation. That, yeah, I guess that's, that's what I wanted. Yeah, thank you. Yes, you had your hand up. Um, I have a question for Miguel. Um, I did read your paper, and I know that you perhaps had a little bit less time in your presentation to address um, this particular area of your paper, so bear with me, everybody else. Um, in terms of the argument um, about the transnational, the emerging tra transnational identity of these bodies, I am sort of still confused about how the um, post-neoliberal regime demand for the local control of the neighborhoods is shaped by the transnational interactions. I think right now there's a focus, and there was a focus in your presentation on very localized reactions to what was going on in the city. Um, and I was wondering if you could perhaps illuminate for us a little bit um, how this post-neoliberal call for neighborhood level control is based on a conflict that comes from a larger arena rather than just the city of Buenos Aires as you emphasized in your presentation. Thank you. And here. Um, I, I want to ask a question uh, for and, um, it, it, it seems to me that one of the great historical con continuities in the, sh in the shape of the space of Buenos Aires is this constantly frustrated policy effort to kind of clear out the center, you know, whatever the center is at the moment, and get the poor people and the, the less white people and so on out of the center and in, out into the margins. And it's, a, it's seemed to still be going on um, and always frustrated. You know, there are bijas you know, right near the microcentro and so on. And I was, 
was thinking two things hearing your, your, your presentation. One of them was, um, does did any of the changes you've been talking about, either in sort of mobilizations coming out of the barrios or the villas, or these communes represent any change in that policy, in that effort to kind of create a sort of a, a clean, you know, well-to-do, orderly center and push the working class and disorder and so on to the, out to the margins. And then also, coming from New York, where the, the gentrification efforts have been so successful in the sense that you don't have that kind of mi mixing of neighborhoods, certainly in Manhattan. It's, it's very, very successfully been pushed out from the outer boroughs to northern Manhattan. And there's, I, part of my reaction to the sort of heterogeneity that you were talking about and that I've experienced in Buenos Aires was, that's fantastic. <laughs> I wish we had more of that around here. And I just wonder if there's another side to that that I'm not thinking of or if you have anything to, to say to that. Okay, we're gonna, uh, we, we don't have much time, so I, one last uh, quick question. talk about this kind of series of uh, translations as Diego kind of comes into Philip's space, this kind of, of Mexico into the United States, of this kind of mural exterior into the sort of domestic interior and of this kind of political engagement into the kind of aesthetic commodity. And I was just wondering if you could, um, you know, maybe read the content of the murals that, you know, Rivera presented in that exhibition as some kind of response to this translation? Like, I mean, a response not just to being in the United States, but also to having his work kind of presented in a museum. I don't know if that was the first time his work was kind of presented in an institutional context, but thanks. Okay, Got, again, two minutes maximum for each person since we're behind schedule. Who wants to start? Well, I would like to respond to the two questions. Um, one thing that, of course, I, I couldn't read the whole presentation because I am always too long writing. <laughs> and there were many things explained about the um, transpositions of the monuments, of the statues of the Indian goddess, Maria Leonza. I, I think I didn't mention that, the statue that broke. And um, the two Columbus statues, their stories. Well, th one of the problems our of, of our country is that we are, uh, we have very few published studies on urban urbanism and in architecture. So people have the feeling that um, the, the architecture of the urban cult culture and the environmental culture is non-existing. It's like there is nothing uh, important to, to be saved. So uh, decisions are taken very easily and very fast. And uh, the, the principal criticism that, that, that is behind our presentation and behind, I, I feel, of all the people that live in Venezuela, that um, are not with this um, regime, is that as there is a lot of money in the country, why there are not new spaces, urban spaces, for the, the celebration of the indigenous cultures, or for the new ideals, political ideals. There are no plazas for the revolution. There are no new squares, no <coughs> new monuments. Uh, it, this obelisk, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with that, but. Uh, of course, it shouldn't be placed in the center of, of the capital and the main Bolivar Square. It's like destroying it. So uh, our, our, our concern is for criticizing uh, an array of decisions that are very easily taken and that they just go away with what there is left. And, uh, and, and that's very sad. Um, one thing that perhaps I didn't um, clarify in my presentation, this problematic character that I was talking about is not that I see it problematical, but these mobilized actors would find these juxtapositions problematical. And yes, the city of Buenos Aires, at least since the early 20th century, has tried to expel the other from the center, and it has failed because basically that large mass of metropolitan poverty, the real Buenos Aires, the real Argentina that Tom was so concerned about, that is ever present and coming back to the center. And it goes on. Uh, the metropolitan police that the mayor of Buenos Aires just started is an, just another attempt to do that, to clear the city of Buenos Aires uh, uh, from that. Um, 
one interesting thing about these neighborhood movements and these mobilized middle classes is that they did not at least explicitly adhere to that. Their local control, they, did, did, they were not as exclusionary, particularly if you compare them to um, suburban uh, s municipal um, decision movements in the United States, the suburban taxpayers, that kind of, of exclusionary behavior was not present among the urban middle classes that I studied. In a way, they tried to uh, frame uh, processes of coexistence, and particularly in terms of the use of urban public space in the street with uh, the metropolitan poor present in their neighborhoods, in the neighborhoods where they reside. They tried to look for ways of articulating that kind of um, living together. I wrote a little bit more about this in a paper that's coming out in Environment and Planning A this year. I can, we can talk about it uh, afterwards too. Um, the, the other question, and um, when uh, the city tr be begins transnationalizing through these mega projects dispersed throughout its space, it, um, I think that's the transnational link because these projects are first financed by transnational capitals, also geared to international tourists to create a cosmopolitan statics in the city. And yes, their consequences are local and they're perhaps experienced locally by the mobilized actors. And that's why they frame their issues and grievances in terms of a neighborhood problem. But it's not a purely neighborhood problem because it's connected to the circuits of capital, to the circuits of international tourism, to those cultural circuits of what constitutes a cosmopolitan static. Hopefully this answers the question more and thank you very much for reading my paper. I just want to add something to what Miguel was saying. I, I actually think there is a, 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 a good parallel with New York City. Uh, many of New York City's central neighborhoods are quite heterogeneous, have resisted displacement. And um, so I, I always think of Buenos Aires as one of the city, parallel cities with, with New York in that, in that sense. The myth of gentrification is that it's all become homogenous, but that, that's quite a myth. So Marcela, concerning your question on how preservation, citizenship, autonomy, and new identities are related. Uh, I think it's key to read preservation in another vocabulary, beyond the vocabulary of the buildings and the particular physicality of what is left of the built environment of the past, but to move on to the bigger questions, like which what Tom was mentioning, Sharon Sukin's uh, politics of authenticity, who and who gets to decide what is to be preserved and to be forgotten, how, when, and what kind of resources are given to that, and what is the discourses that accompany that kind of preservation. So, because it's fundamental in the way that it shapes habitus, these frameworks of thought that condition paths of action, and uh, those paths of action are related or unrelated to recognition and redistribution of power, of resources, of space, and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that it is fundamental to re-read preservation in this other light. And uh, particularly, for example, in the case of Ponce, the new identities, there is, uh, uh, even if preservation has moved from this basic Hispanophilic uh, preservation-based uh, uh, view, it's still very exclusionary. It is no luck, it is not by luck, for example, that the diaspora elements of Puerto Rico are not still in the main discourse of preservation. Dominicans, for example, are now a large chunk of, of the visible other in Puerto Rico, but they are absolutely excluded from preservation. So this is completely tied to notions of entitlements, to notions of rights, who has to say who has a right to say, or what is, to, is we are remembering the past of four or 500 years ago or the past of five years ago, what is our past and where is it leading? So I think in this other way of seeing it, it's where I want to frame my discussion and it's still a lot to be done, for example, on this, in the case of immigrants in Puerto Rico, you know, big absence. In, in the case of the themes of the Rivera murals, I mean, 
we have two instances. One of the murals that he was brought to New York to perform for the museum, um, there were a total of eight, I believe, uh, six were citing the murals in Cuernavaca and um, in Chapingo and Mexico City, that is what he became famous for, and then two were actually murals about New York. Um, sadly, these murals have disappeared. Nobody knows where they are, um, so we don't know actually the exact you know, um, subject matters of, 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 uh, of those murals. In the case of the ones that were reproduced, I mean, they do not abandon, you know, the revolutionary images. I mean, they have pe peasants, workers, uh, Carrillo is there, Zapata is also there. So, you know, he still maintains, you know, the notion of, this, of, of revolutionary narrative. And in the end, um, this is where it's played. You know, if Johnson was actually forwarding a, a narrative of blank walls, right, the Rivera and, and other people are actually uh, forwarding narratives on walls in a, in a crisis state, uh, specifically in New York, right? So that's... It's a, it's a narrative of, of crisis and revolutionary and revolution. Mm. Okay, thank you all very much.